Pig and Pepper. For a minute or two, Alice stood looking at the house, wondering what to do next. Suddenly, a footman came out of the woods. She thought he must be a footman because of how he was dressed, but looking at his face, she would have called him a fish. He rapped loudly on the door. It was opened by another footman. He had a round face and large eyes like a frog. Alice crept out of the wood to listen. The fish footman began by handing over a large letter. It's for the Duchess, he said. It's an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. The frog footman replied in the same solemn tone. From the Queen, an invitation for the Duchess to play croquet. Then they both bowed low and their curls got entangled together. Alice <laughs> laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the wood so they wouldn't hear her. When she next peeped out, the fish footman was gone. Alice went timidly up to the door and knocked. There's no use of knocking, said the footman. I'm on your side of the door. And they're making such a noise inside, no one could hear you. Certainly there was a most extraordinary noise going on within, a constant howling and sneezing. Every now and then there was a great crash, as if a dish or kettle had been broken to pieces. Please then, said Alice, how am I to get in? There might be some sense in your knocking, the footman went on, if we had the door between us. For instance, if you were inside, you might knock and I could let you out. He was looking up into the sky all the time he was speaking. But perhaps he can't help it, she said to herself. His eyes are so very nearly at the top of his head. But at any rate, he might answer questions. So she repeated out loud. How am I to get in? But all the footman would say in reply was, I shall sit here till tomorrow. At this moment, the door of the house opened, and a large plate came skimming out straight at the footman's head. It just grazed his nose and broke to pieces against one of the trees behind him. Oh, there's no use in talking to him, said Alice. She opened the door and went in. The door led right into a large kitchen which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron which seemed to be full of soup. There's certainly too much pepper in that soup, Alice said. She had to try and stop sneezing herself. There was certainly too much pepper in the air. Even the Duchess sneezed from time to time. As for the baby, it was sneezing and howling without a moment's pause. There was a large cat lying on the hearth and grinning from ear to ear. Please, would you tell me, said Alice timidly, why your cat grins like that? It's a Cheshire cat, said the Duchess. And that's why, said Alice. I didn't know Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know that cats could grin. They all can, said the Duchess. And most of them do. Then the cook set to work. She started throwing everything she could find at the Duchess and the baby. The fire irons came first, followed by a shower of saucepans, plates and dishes. The Duchess took no notice of them, even when they hit her. And the baby just howled and howled. Oh, please mind what you're doing! cried Alice, jumping up and down. An unusually large saucepan flew close by the baby. People should mind their own business, the Duchess said in a hoarse growl. If they did so, the world would go round a deal faster than it does. Then she began nursing the baby again, singing a sort of lullaby to it as she did so. At the end of every line, she gave the baby a shake. The poor thing howled so that Alice could hardly hear the words. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. Then the cook and the baby joined in the chorus. Wow, wow, wow. While the Duchess sang the second verse, she kept tossing the baby violently up and down. The poor little thing howled so much, Alice could hardly hear the words. Yeah, you may nurse it a bit if you like, the Duchess said to Alice, flinging the baby at her as she spoke. I must go and get ready to play croquet.
get with the queen. Then she suddenly disappeared. The cook threw a frying pan after her as she went, but it just missed her. Alice caught the baby. It was a queer-shaped little creature and held out its arms and legs in all directions. She carried the baby out into the open air. It's just like a starfish, thought Alice. The poor little thing was snorting like a steam engine. It kept doubling itself up and straightening itself out again so that it was as much as she could do to hold it. By this time it had stopped sneezing and started grunting instead. Don't grunt, said Alice. That's not at all a proper way of expressing yourself. The baby grunted again. Alice looked very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. She thought it had a very turned up nose and its eyes were getting very small for a baby. Alice didn't like the look of it at all. Said Alice, seriously, If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Now, what am I to do with this creature when I get it home? Alice wondered. Suddenly it grunted again, so violently that she looked down into its face in alarm. This time there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig. She felt it would be quite absurd for her to carry it any further. So she set the little creature down and felt quite relieved to see it trot away quietly into the wood. If it had grown up, she said to herself, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child. But I think it makes rather a handsome pig. And she began thinking of other children she knew who might do very well as pigs. If one only knew the right way to change them, she said to herself, when she was a little startled, by seeing the Cheshire Cat sitting on the bough of a tree only a few yards away. The cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt it ought to be treated with respect. Cheshire Puss, she began rather timidly, as she didn't at all know whether it would like the name. However, it only grinned a little wider. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added by way of explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat. If you only walk long enough. Alice tried another question. What sort of people live around here? In that direction, the cat said, waving its right paw around, lives a hatter. And in that direction, waving the other paw, lives a March hare. Visit whichever you like. They're both mad. But I don't want to go among mad people, said Alice. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. How do you know I'm mad? asked Alice. You must be, said the cat. Or you wouldn't have come here. Then it vanished. Alice was not much surprised at this. She was getting well used to queer things happening. The Cheshire Cat suddenly appeared again. By the by, what became of the baby? said the cat. It turned into a pig, Alice answered very quietly. I thought it would, said the cat, and vanished again. Alice decided to walk to the March Hare's house. I've seen hatters before, she said to herself. The March Hare will be much more interesting. Perhaps... As this is May, it won't be so mad as it was in March. She looked up, and there was the cat again. Did you say pig or fig? said the cat. I said pig, replied Alice. And I wish you wouldn't keep appearing and vanishing so suddenly. You make me quite giddy. All right, said the cat. This time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of its tail and ending with the grin which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. A Mad Tea Party 
There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house. The March Hare and the Hatter were having tea. A Dormouse was sitting between them, fast asleep. The table was a large one, but the three were all crowded together at one corner of it. No room! No room! They cried out when they saw Alice coming. There's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly. She sat down in a large armchair at one end of the table. Have some wine, the March Hare said in an encouraging tone. Alice looked all round the table, but there was nothing on it but tea. I don't see any wine, she remarked. There isn't any, said the March Hare. One day of the month, is it? said the Hatter, turning to Alice. He'd taken his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it, uneasily, shaking it every now and then and holding it to his ear. Alice considered a little and then said, The fourth. Oh, two days wrong, sighed the Hatter. I told you butter wouldn't suit the wax, he added, looking angrily at the March Hare. It was the best butter, the March Hare meekly replied. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well, the Hatter grumbled. The March Hare took the watch and looked at it gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again. Alice had been looking over his shoulder with some curiosity. What a funny watch, she remarked. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? muttered the Hatter. Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, Alice replied very readily. But that's because it stays the same year for such a long time. Which is just the case with mine, said the Hatter. Alice felt dreadfully puzzled. I don't quite understand you, she said politely. The Dormouse is asleep again, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea on its nose. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with the time, she said, than wasting it. If you knew time as well as I do, said the Hatter, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean, said Alice. Of course you don't, the Hatter said. I dare say you've never even spoken to time. Perhaps not, Alice cautiously replied. But I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it, said the Hatter. He won't stand beating. Now, if you only kept on good terms with time, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You'd only have to whisper a hint to time, and round goes the clock in a twinkling. Up! Last one time for dinner. That would be grand, certainly, said Alice thoughtfully. But then I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know. Not at first, perhaps, said the Hatter. But you could keep it to half past one as long as you liked. Is that the way you manage? Alice asked. The Hatter shook his head sadly. <gasps> Not I, he replied. We quarrelled last March, just before he went mad, you know. He pointed with his teaspoon at the March Hare. It was at the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had to sing, Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. Uh, you know the song, perhaps? I've heard something like it, said Alice. It uh, goes on, you know, the Hatter continued, in this way. Up! Above the world you fly, like a tea tree in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle. Here the Dormouse shook itself and began singing in its sleep. Twinkle, 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 twinkle. It went on so long they had to pinch it to make it stop. <laughs> well, I'd hardly finished the first verse said the Hatter. When the Queen bawled out, he's murdering the time off with his head. How dreadfully savage, exclaimed Alice. And never since that, the Hatter went on in a sad tone, he won't do a thing, I asked. It's always six o'clock now. Suppose we change the subject, the March Hare interrupted, yawning. Oh, I'm getting tired of this. 
I don't think... Said Alice, very much confused. Then you shouldn't talk, said the Hatter. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. They took no notice of her going, though she looked back once or twice, half hoping they would call after her. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in all my life. Just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought. But everything's curious today. I think I may as well go in at once. And in she went. At last she found herself in the beautiful garden, among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. The Queen's Croquet Ground A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses on it were white, but there were three gardeners busily painting them red. Alice thought this a very curious thing, and she went nearer to watch them. She heard one of them say, Look out now, Five. Don't go splashing paint over me. Well, I couldn't help it, said Five in a sulky tone. Seven jogged my elbow. Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five. Always lay the blame on others. You'd better not talk, said Five. I heard the Queen say only yesterday you deserve to be beheaded. What for? said the one who'd spoken first. That's none of your business, too, said Seven. Yes, it is his business, said Five. And I'll tell him it was for bringing the cook tulip bulbs instead of onions. Seven flung down his brush. Then his eye fell on Alice. The others looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Would you tell me, please, why you are painting those roses? asked Alice. Two said in a low voice, well, you see, miss, there should have been a red rose tree, and we put a white one in by mistake. If the queen was to find out, we would all have our heads cut off. At this moment, Five called out, The queen! The queen! Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. Along came a procession of soldiers and courtiers. They were all shaped like the gardeners. Then Alice saw the white rabbit. It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner. It went by without noticing her. Next came the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all came the king and queen of hearts. When the procession came opposite Alice, they all stopped and looked at her. What is your name, child? asked the queen. My name is Alice, so please, your majesty, said Alice very politely. But she added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards after all. I needn't be afraid of them. The queen shouted at Alice, Can you play croquet? Yes, shouted Alice. Come on then, roared the queen. Alice wondered what would happen next. Get to your places, shouted the queen in a voice of thunder. People began running in all directions. When they got settled, the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows. The croquet balls were live hedgehogs and the mallets were flamingos. To make the arches, the soldiers had to double themselves up and stand on their hands and feet. Alice found it difficult to manage her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away under her arm with its legs hanging down. But generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out, it would twist itself round and look up in her face. Then, when she'd got its head down and was going to begin again, she found the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was crawling away. The doubled-up soldiers, too, were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground. The queen was in a furious passion, shouting all the time, Off with his head! Or, Off with her head! Alice began to feel very uneasy. She looked for some way to escape when she noticed something very strange. After a minute or two, she realized it was a grin. She said to herself, It's the Cheshire Cat. Now I have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on? Said the cat, when there was mouth enough for it to speak with. 
Alice waited until its eyes appeared. It's no use speaking to it, she thought, till its ears have come, or at least one of them. In another minute, the whole head appeared. The cat seemed to think that there was enough of it now in sight, and no more of it appeared. How do you like the queen? asked the cat. Not at all, said Alice. Then she saw the queen was close behind her listening. She smiled and passed on. Who are you talking to? said the king, looking at the cat's head with great curiosity. It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat, said Alice. Allow me to introduce it. I don't like the look of it at all, said the king. Wah, wah, wah. It may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not, the cat remarked. Don't be impertinent, said the king. And don't look at me like that. He called to the queen who was passing at that moment. Oh, my dear, I wish you would have this cat removed. The queen had only one way of settling all difficulties, great or small. Off with his head, she said, without even looking round. The king went to get the executioner. But the executioner argued that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body. And the king argued that anything that had a head could be beheaded. And the queen argued that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed all round. They all began to look very anxious. Who stole the tarts? When Alice arrived at the court, the king and queen of hearts were seated on their throne. The knave was standing before them in chains. Near the king was the white rabbit, with a trumpet in one hand and a scroll of parchment in the other. In the very middle of the court was a table with a large dish of tarts on it. They looked so good it made Alice quite hungry to look at them. I wish they'd get the trial done, she thought, and hand round the refreshments. Alice had never been in a court of justice before, but she had read about them in books. She was quite pleased to find she knew the name of nearly everything there. That's the judge, she said to herself, because of his great wig. The judge, by the way, was the king. He wore his crown over his wig. And that's the jury box, thought Alice. And I suppose those creatures are the jurors. Errol, read the accusation, said the king. The white rabbit blew three blasts on the trumpet and then unrolled the parchment scroll. This is what he read. The, the Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer day. The Knave of Hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. Consider your verdict, the king said to the jury. Not yet, not yet. The half-rabbit hastily interrupted. There's a great deal to come before that. Call the first witness, said the king. The white rabbit blew three blasts on the trumpet. The first witness was the hatter. He came in with a teacup in one hand and a piece of bread and butter in the other. Take off your hat, the king said to the hatter. It isn't mine, said the hatter. Stolen, the king exclaimed, turning to the jury who instantly made a note of the fact. I keep them to sell, the hatter added as an explanation. I've none of my own. I'm a hatter. Give your evidence, said the king. And don't be nervous, or I'll have you executed on the spot. This did not seem to encourage the witness at all. He kept shifting from one foot to the other. In his confusion, he bit a large piece out of his teacup instead of the bread and butter. Just at this moment, Alice felt a very curious sensation. It puzzled her a good deal until she made out what it was. She was beginning to grow larger again. Give your evidence! the king repeated angrily. This made the wretched hatter tremble so he shook off both his shoes. You may go, said the king. The hatter hurriedly left the court without even waiting to put his shoes on. Call the next witness, said the king. It was the duchess's cook. She carried the pepper box in her hand. Give your evidence, said the king. Shut, said the cook. The king folded his arms and frowned at the cook. What are tarts made of? he asked. Pepper mostly, said the cook. 
Never mind, said the king. Call the next witness. Alice watched the white rabbit as he fumbled over the list, feeling very curious to see what the next witness would be like. Imagine her surprise when the white rabbit read out at the top of his shrill little voice the name... Alice! Alice's evidence. I'm here, cried Alice, quite forgetting how large she'd grown in the last few minutes. What do you know about this business? The king said to Alice. Nothing, said Alice. Nothing whatever, persisted the king. Nothing whatever, said Alice. That's very important, the king said, turning to the jury. They were just beginning to write this down on their slates when the white rabbit spoke. An important, your majesty means, of course, he said in a very respectful tone, but frowning and making faces at him. Um, unimportant, of course, I meant, the king hastily said. He went on to himself in an undertone. Important, unimportant, unimportant, important. As if he were trying which word sounded best. Some of the jury wrote it down important, and some unimportant. Alice could see this as she was near enough to look over their slates. But it doesn't matter a bit, she thought to herself. At this moment, the king, who'd been for some time busily writing in his notebook, called out, Silence! He read out from his book, Rule 42. All persons more than a mile high to leave the court. Everybody looked at Alice. I'm not a mile high, said Alice. You are, said the king. Nearly two miles high, added the queen. Well, I shan't go, said Alice. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. It's the oldest rule in the book, said the king. Then it ought to be number one, said Alice. She had grown so large in the last few minutes, she wasn't a bit afraid of interrupting him. The king turned pale and shut his notebook hastily. Consider your verdict, he said to the jury. No, no, said the queen. Sentence first, verdict afterwards. Stuff and nonsense, said Alice loudly. The idea of having the sentence first. Hold your tongue, said the queen, turning purple. I won't, said Alice. Off with her head, the queen shouted at the top of her voice. Nobody moved. Who cares for you? said Alice, who had grown to her full size by this time. You're nothing but a pack of cards. At this, the whole pack rose up into the air and came flying down upon her. She gave a little scream, half of fright and half of anger, and tried to beat them off. She found herself lying on the bank with her head in the lap of her sister, who was gently brushing away some dead leaves that had fluttered down from the trees upon her face. Wake up, Alice, dear, said her sister. Why, what a long sleep you've had. Oh, I've had such a curious dream, said Alice. And she told her sister, as well as she could remember them, all these strange adventures of hers that you have just been reading about. When she had finished, her sister kissed her and said, It was a curious dream, dear, certainly. But now run in to your tea. It's getting late. So Alice got up and ran off, thinking while she ran, as well she might. What a wonderful dream it had been. <laughs>